Welcome back to another episode of the SDI Killer Evo 6 presented by Koyorad. Today we start assembling the short block. As you would have seen at the end of the previous episode, we completed the bearing clearance checks both on the main bearings and on the big end rod bearings. And everything was well within spec, or at least I should say for the specs that uh, Andre from HP Academy gave us. They're a little bit looser than factory spec, but when you're dealing with a more powerful engine, you do want a little extra clearance for reasons that we'll explain later on. However, we also decided to do a sanity check using some plastic gauge. So, Plastic gauge is an old school way of measuring uh, oil clearances on your bearings and inside this package is this very thin piece of green uh, wax like substance and it comes in a very specific thickness. This is designed in the green to measure between one thou and three thou and uh, you lay it across the journal on the crank and then either install the main cap or the rod depending on what clearance you're checking, torque it down to spec and it squishes this down and that squish you then measure on this scale along the, uh, the container here, if you want to call it that, the sleeve, and the thickness of that squish tells you what your clearance is. So it's a very uh, old school and less precise way of measuring clearances than using a bore gauge, but at least it gives you a ballpark figure and lets you have the peace of mind of knowing that, okay, my bore uh, measurements make sense. This sort of like confirms that you're in that much ballpark. cheaper than a bore gauge, right? It is. This package costs a few bucks versus a bore gauge. You know, ours is sort of like a mid-range one, and it was, I think, around 180 bucks or something like that. Yeah, I think so. You can spend a lot more or less, but uh, the Fowler stuff seems to be pretty good. So, in any case, we've done that sanity check. Everything does check out nicely there. So we are satisfied that our bearings are all where we want them to be, which means it's time to move on to actually final assemble, final assembly on the engine or at least I should say on the short block. Step one for us today is to set our piston ring end gaps. So this is our uh, piston ring set, which came with the JE Ultra series pistons. You can see they're JE Pro Seal rings. And we've just finished watching the module on HP Academy about setting ring end gaps. So we've had a quick re-education here from Andre. If you want to sign up for that course, we have a discount code for you in the description worth $75. So it is a like it's 40% off their practical engine building guide. So it's a serious discount. I think you could also apply that to their other courses. They have courses there for engine tuning and for uh, wiring harness building. So in any case, we have used JE's chart here on how to uh, determine your ring end gap. And based on this chart and where we think this motor falls, we've kind of gone for the street moderate turbo uh, build level that that's uh, telling us we need to set our top ring to 17 thou and our second compression ring to 19 thou. So that's what we're going to be looking for here. So this is our top compression ring, which I'm just going to drop in the hole here. And then we will see what we've got for clearance right out of the box. To set that ring squarely and to a consistent depth in the cylinder, I'm just using the factory piston. We've removed the top ring and we're just using the second compression ring here as our, our, like our, our stopper. So I'm just gonna drop it in the hole here and you can see we'll push that ring down in. This ring stops it. So we know that ring is nice and square in the hole. So to check that end gap, I of course, I'm gonna use feeler gauges like these. I've uh, just selected 16 thou on here, which is very close to the spec. I just picked that randomly really because I don't know visually how big the gap is. Uh, the other thing you wanna check for, by the way, is that the, the two ends of the ring are nice and square. So you don't want it to be tapered or V-shaped in either direction. And if it is, then that's something we will address with our uh, ring end gap file. But first I wanna see what we're at gap-wise here. So the 16 just goes in there, but man, it, it tightens toward the back. So we are a little bit V-shaped and the 16 is tight and we wanna to go to 17. So we know that we have to take something off. I'll just uh, try the 15 in here to see if it's uh, looser, I, I imagine it would be, but let's check and see. 15 thou is very loose. So yeah, 16 thou is, feels good for the first half, but then it gets too tight at the back where the, the, the lack of squareness in those two ends affects it. So we need to square that up and just open up a slight bit. We just need to square that up and open it up a slight bit. So we'll show you how to do that now. Time to file our top ring. And as you saw, we are very close to the spec we want to get to. So I'm going to 
do a very, very small amount of filing here. I also n notice that we are slightly out of square, so I'm gonna try to take a little bit more out on the inside than on the outside shoulder. This is really fine stuff, but in any case, I am following the uh, procedure that Andre outlines in their uh, ring gap module. So on a manual file like this, you wanna make sure that you file in a counterclockwise direction so that you're filing from the outside of the ring to the inside of the ring. Apparently if you go the other way, you can damage the, uh, there's like a inset or in uh, set coating on the outside of the ring here that you can peel off if you go the wrong way. So you wanna go outside in. And uh, as far as technique goes, you just lay the ring down on here, push it up against these two stoppers. And as you can see, with just with a little bit of pressure on the ring, I can squeeze it up there against the, the file itself quite easily. So now that I've got it in the position I want, I am going to uh, get my hands in a better position here and just do a little bit of filing. Make a couple of turns here. All right, I'm putting this back in the same cylinder where we originally measured it. And I'm gonna use that old piston to square it up in there. Well, let's just check the 17 then and see if we are closer to the spec we wanna be at. No, it's still tight. You can see I can get about halfway in there and then it's stopping. So you can see I'm, that means we're still a little bit tapered toward the outside of the ring. So I need to do a little bit more filing on the outside of the ring to, before I can get this 17 in there. Ambitiously, I'm going in with a 17 here, which is the spec we want. And, oh man, that feels on the money. This guy's just got a little bit of drag all the way across, which means I've got that end gap nice and square. Now that we've got our top ring dialed in, it's time to set the gap on our second compression ring. And interestingly, it's got a different finish on it, and it also has a different profile to it. It's got a little bit of a step in it. I'm not sure why that is, if that's functioning as a oil scraper or something, but in any case, we are going, as per JE's uh, chart, we are going uh, 2 thou larger on this gap. So this is gonna be a 19 thou gap versus the 17 on the top ring. Same process, we're just gonna drop it in the hole here, set it down squarely in the bore, take our initial measurement and go from there. I'm gonna try the 17 here and see it, if it fits. Oh wow, the 17 is loose. Maybe we're gonna like magically be right on spec here? Let's find out. I'm going right to the 19, PT. Is that possible? I don't know. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you roll sevens. Let's see what we get here. Oh, the 19 is nice. Woo! No work to do on this one. And the, uh, the gap looks nice and square too. So I think we're on the money there. So now that we've got our gap set for our top and second compression rings, I am going to uh, do what Andre at HP Academy recommends, and that is deburring the side that I filed. So I only filed on this side. And if you look very closely, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera, but there is a tiny bit of a burr along this top edge here on the top side. If I flip it over, yeah, there's a tiny bit of a burr there too. So Andre just recommends using a very fine hand file like this one and coming in at about a 45 degree angle, just very gently chasing that burr off of there. What you don't wanna do is take any material, excess material off of the ring you just want to file it enough that you get the burr off there, and uh, that way you're good to go.
there you have it. We have completed checking all of the end gaps on our piston rings. And strangely, all of the second compression rings measured out at 20 thou without needing any kind of filing. So I mean, that's a bonus. We didn't have to do any work, but it's kind of surprising that they all fit up like that. The top rings all required a bit of filing and they weren't all square. So there was a little bit of work there. I was very cautious with how much filing I did. So we went back and forth quite a few times on a number of the cylinders to get it really dialed in the way we like it. But we're happy now with the way everything's fitting up. We've got 17 thou on the top ring and 20 thou on the bottom ring. So we're gonna move on now to installing the pistons on the rods. Next step here, we are going to be installing our wire lock into our piston. And this is a finicky job. We just watched the tutorial on HP Academy. And um, what he does is he takes a binder clip or a bulldog clip and, and takes it apart and wants to use it to, to hold in on the other side here when you put the wrist pin in to lock it in place. We're actually gonna use a cotter pin. So the first step here is to take our wrist pin uh, that I've lightly lubed and slide it into our piston here. And now we're gonna take the cotter pin and just lock it in place like that. It's not ideal, it doesn't uh, work as well as the binder clip, but as you can see, our wrist pin is where it needs to be. Now we're gonna take the, the wire clip or the wire lock and what you don't wanna do is position this over here at all because this relief out, this relief area here, if this locks in place, you're, not, you're never getting this out. So um, what I found is I wanna get it as far as possible this way on this side here so I can get as much of this into the, the relief there. And then you gotta use your hands to kinda of like push it in. There it goes, you kinda of heard that little snap there. So now we're gonna come around and of course, every piston manufacturer is different with these JE ones. What I'm gonna do now is take a screwdriver while pushing my thumb on the, the, the wire lock. I'm gonna slowly and gently just push this in like that, as you saw. And one more little push here. And you don't wanna really be pushing against the piston. You kinda of wanna just be using the, the screwdriver to pry up, there you go. So as you can see, it is so close. And now all I'm gonna do is push this inwards, bam. And she is locked in. And now we can move on, we can pull this out. So you can see it's, it's not overly difficult. Once you figure the technique out, it's, it's quite simple. It's just a little finicky. Now that we've got our piston and rod made it up, and boy, that feels nice. Satisfying process, isn't it, Pete? Putting something like this together. It feels like you're doing something important. Yeah. Make your engine stay in one piece. And uh, I should mention that we are using these K1 Technology H-beam rods. These are constructed of a billet 4340 material. And uh, as you saw Pete lubing up the, uh, the, the bronze bushing on the uh, piston end here, uses a very high quality bushing in there. These are obviously a lot beefier than the factory rods, which you can see here. Like, look at the, the difference in size here. The amount, of, uh, the amount of power we're gonna be able to throw at these rods is obviously much, much greater than what we could do with the stock rods. Oh, uh, well, one last detail I should mention too is that the, uh, the K1 technology rods do come with these very high quality ARP 2000 bolts. So these are very strong and you can uh, reuse them as well. So we are able to, you know, torque them down to check our bearing clearances and then torque them down again and they, uh, they're able to take that kind of abuse. So we are now gonna move on to the uh, installation of our piston ring.
that, I have all of the rings installed on our pistons here and uh, went relatively smoothly. I'm not an expert on how to use the, uh, the, the, the ring expanding tool, but started to get a feel for it. And as you would have seen, I very closely followed this roadmap to where all the gaps need to be set on all of the rings. So we will double and triple check those as we're installing them into the, uh, into the block, but they are all lined up as per the instructions here for the time being, which means we can now move on to installing the crank because that needs to go in the block before these can go in there. As you can see, we've got our bearings in there with some assembly lube on them and the crankshaft is ready to go in. I've just cleaned all the journals carefully one last time. So I'm going to drop this guy in there and by drop, I mean very gently place it in the hole as carefully as I possibly can. So she is in there. Girdle is going on and I've already, uh, put some lube on the bearings in this as well. So once it's in place, we are going to torque this down for the final time. Torquing our bolts here is a little unconventional. Everything's being set to, I'm sorry, all the bolts are being torqued to 25 newton meters. And then the next step is now to turn all of these another 90 degrees. So I've paint marked these and from here on out, I'm gonna have a look here and always start in the middle and add 90 degrees. So this is gonna beep, but I'm gonna be well past that. Okay, and just a little bit more. All right, here we are. All the main bolts are torqued to spec and we should mention we aren't using ARP studs here. Andre recommended that, well, he didn't rec recommend, he said we didn't need to upgrade to the studs. We could use the old bolts because we're not going to be, the power level we're going for, we're fine there. We did also put in our thrust washers. I'm sure some of you are going to comment about that, that we missed that point, but we didn't. We're not trying to show you guys every little step. That's what uh, HP Academy is for. We're just trying to show you the main stuff. So now we've got everything in place. Let me just turn the crank here. Oh man, it's smooth. It looks like we have everything ready to go. So I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's time we drop the pistons in here. Much like us, if this is your first time dropping the pistons into the block, what you're going to want to do is double check everything. And that means make sure your uh, rings are facing the right way. Make sure you've oiled everything. Make sure you've got your connecting rod facing the right way and you've got the right piston for the right hole, which we've done. And as you can see, we're using a universal uh, piston ring presser, press tool, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, there's ARP makes really nice ones for the specific bore that you can use. We, uh, we didn't buy those. We just went to NV Auto and grabbed their their universal ones. So what you want to do here is you're going to get everything lined up and then slowly drop it into the, the hole here. Now with it in the hole there, what I'm going to do is make sure my compressor is flat against the block and tap, 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 tap it down. And I don't know, I think this is the best way to do it is one swift blow here. You don't want to kind of like tap it, tap it, tap it down slowly because then it's going to give one of the rings the ability to pop out. So I'm just going to go pop and we are in there. Look at that. So I'm going to do the second one and then we're going to flip this thing around. To tighten the connecting rod bolts, we are not using a torque gauge. That is not the method that you want to go with here. Uh, what you want to do is use the stretch gauge technique. This is the most reliable, the, the soundest, and the preferred method of doing this. And it's really not that difficult. All you really need to do is get yourself one of these gauges. This is a Lunati gauge that I think I got off of Amazon or Jegs, one place or uh, one, one spot or another, somewhere online. And what you're going to do is I'm going to put an 11 mil wrench onto the ARP bolt here. And now I'm going to place this gauge on here. And as you can see, it's locked in place. And now what I'm going to do is zero it out right here. And these little indicators here I've set for 
our uh, stretch spec, which I think is 55 to 59 thou. So I'm gonna get into position here and start working away. Because as you can see, it's, uh, it's a little tight, but can you guys see that? I'll try to keep the gauge showing it, but yeah, it's slowly starting to come up. And then what you continue to do, there you go, and we'll call it done. Whew. That feels really tight. But as you can see, we're right at the higher end of the spectrum there. So that one's good. We're gonna move on to the other one and then we are done. Next up, we have our oil pump assembly and our balance shaft assembly here that we're gonna be putting back on the engine. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, why didn't we delete these? Well, first of all, I find they, uh, when you remove these, they add a bunch of NVH. So I had this done on my Eagle Talon way back in the day and it just rattled everything loose. I didn't like it. And for the five horsepower max that you're gonna add by removing these, I don't think it's worth it. So we're not gonna be taking these out. And then you gotta do a bunch of little minor mods to, to the oil galleys to make sure that your oil pressure still stays up. So nevertheless, this is going on, but before we put this on, we have a bunch of gaskets that we, had to, we have to install. And for that, I turned to MA Performance. They literally are one of the top Evo experts and online retailers uh, out there. And this is a complete Mitsubishi OEM gasket set. So I was able to get that from them very quick and easy. I love their customer service. They're really a great company to work with. They're also Evo uh, owners and, and former DSM guys too. So um, very cool company. Thank you for providing this to us very quickly. So I'm gonna get this opened up and then we can put the gaskets in and the seals and all that. And then we can slide this front pump assembly on. Some of you may be wondering how I got this surface so clean. The old gasket was really, really crusty and 3M gasket and uh, adhesive remover discs. So these are like these really nice discs that I put on my uh, Milwaukee grinder here. And they work fantastic. I highly recommend them. They don't score the metal. So awesome little uh, discs to remove the old gasket. And as you can see, I'm about to put in place the, the new gasket here from Mitsubishi. But before I do so, I'm, excuse me, I'm just gonna take a little bit of uh, silicone and just dab it in a couple spots so it'll hold itself in place. It's a large enough gasket where you might get a little bit of uh, movement or play and I want to kind of keep it in the right spot so I'm gonna do that and as you can see it's starting to stick already which is nice. Gasket is holding so let us see if I can get this lined up here and back into the hole. Slow and steady. There we are. It's like installing a push rod camshaft. I know, this is like a full huge assembly here. Bam, perfect. So let me get a couple bolts in here and we can tighten this up and then I gotta put the, uh, the main seal in here. For our crankshaft seal, of course Mitsubishi recommends a special tool and that is because of a long snout of the crankshaft. However, I've got our, what size is this? Holy smokes, this is a one and 13 16 inch socket here and it kind of lines up perfectly with it. So I am gonna just tap this in here and hopefully it just goes in without any issue. There we go, let me check all the way around. That feels very flush DP, I think we're gonna call that Good. Well, everyone, we have sadly run out of time here, but a monumental moment has been reached. Our rotating assembly is together. Man, this block is looking really nice. I cannot wait to get this back together. Um, but I wanted to, before I, I close this episode off, I wanted to ask you guys. So uh, first of all, thank you to Daniel who shipped this oil pan to me. Thank you so much. Uh, the, our Evo 6 oil pan here has a rather nasty dent in it. So that's why I put a call out and uh, Dan came through here. However, I'm looking at it and uh, it's a little bit different than the one we have. As you can see, we're missing a bit of a baffle right here. A windage or a tray. windage yeah, tray, yeah. sorry. And um, 
this area, which I, I guess is somewhat of a baffle, uh, is lower in the pan than this one. The hole is different. So I can see the relief for the pickups different. This whole area is different here. So there's a lot of differences going on here and uh, I'm not 100% sure I should try to use this oil pan. Uh, you Evo experts, let me know, do I have like, maybe this is a four or, or five oil pan and whether it can be usable. Maybe it is or maybe it isn't. Let me know in the comments. Uh, worst case scenario, I think we might have to just pound this one out a little bit. It should be fine and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Uh, make sure to check the, the video description for the discount code for HP Academy. If you guys are in a similar situation and you're looking to build a motor, there's a ton of great info there. And of course, think about subscribing and hitting that notification bell because we've got another episode of the Evo Engine Build coming up very shortly.